everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Internetology. Uh, I'm back again. Um, this is the second episode. And um, if you're new here and you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Katherine Zimmerman, and I'm a psychology and sociology uh, major at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, and this uh, podcast is for uh, a class that I'm taking called The Psychological Effects of the Internet. Um, and that's kind of, uh, about getting you up to speed, but, um, today, uh, we're going to be looking at the evolution and complexity of learning, um, and how it relates to the internet and psychology. And so, uh, a little bit of overview of what we'll be covering today. Um, first we're going to be going over, um, informal, formal, and non-formal learning, and what those entail, what are they, um, since I wanted to give context on uh, what is learning. And I think in order to understand um, how the internet impacts learning, I think we also first have to understand what learning is and if the like the different types of learning. Um, next, we'll be going over the shift from traditional to non-traditional learning environments. Um, this more so entails the transition from formal to non-formal uh, environments and or uh, traditional academic educational settings to online uh, or virtual learning environments. So um, we'll be going over the important considerations and the implications of this, um, how it relates to e-learning, which is the term that they use in the article, and also um, be going over the criticisms of the informal learning that are also mentioned um, in the article and how and that are also related to e-learning. Um, next, we'll be going over how to improve uh, learning um, and I think this is relevant because uh, in order to improve like learning and improve the learning experience, I think it's important to understand the research behind uh, studying learning, which is the article that I will be um, analyzing and also how it relates to learning in general, because I think in order to research learning, I think it's also important to implement the same things um into actually the learning process um then finally we'll be going over the biological capacity to learn um and we'll be looking at scientific evidence of what that process entails and like the biological bio, ah, biology behind uh learning and learning also too like learning is such a broad top like term and so learning in regards to that our memory um and I, i'll be going over like memory um and like the process of learning and just like the biological components of it next we'll also um be talking about lifelong learning and what that means and what that entails and how the internet uh promotes lifelong learning or supports lifelong learning um so yeah i'm looking forward to getting into all that and I'm going to first start with um, explaining what informal and non-formal learning are. Um, so first off, we have this article that was published by Berkeley, uh, People and Culture. Um, and it talks about what informal learning is. Um, so we're just going to go through this article a little bit and figure out um what informal learning is and i'll show you a few things that stood out to me um but in a sense uh it's important to understand that learning does not always occur in a classroom setting um and uh, according to berkeley the informal learning theory is organic unstructured and learner driven um and also it provides learners with new opportunities to expand their reference and knowledge points and because it is learner driven it is a self-directed and less stressful process so um that's kind of what berkeley 
uh, kind of discussed about what informal learning is. And I think that they did a pretty good job at summarizing it, but I'd also like to get a little bit more information um, since this is kind of a very small snippet, I think, of what in, of what informal learning is or doesn't capture the entire idea. So um, then we're going to look at um, this article here, uh, if it loads, hopefully, yes. <laughs> OK, sweet. So um, in this article, um, they discuss um, ways that informal learning is defined and the aspects of learning. Um, and so we're going to look at um, a few sentences, if I can find them. Um, but yes, yeah, so basically part of <clears throat> the definition of informal learning in this context <clears throat> is that it um, occurs through incidental everyday experiences. So informal learning, in a sense, is just like the experiences that you're experiencing like you're experiencing um, and not necessarily in like a formal context where you go to a class and you sit and you learn. It's just more so like life, like throughout life, you're learning every single day, regardless of whether or not that's intentional or not intentional. Um, here they say unstructured learning, basically the same thing. Um, and I'm trying to find the art and the the place that oh, one of the senses that I that stuck out to me um I'm just gonna do this image of oh okay well the first sense that's kind of the sense that I was that I wanted to first start out with but whatever um and then we're on someone that he cited in the article um, here is that uh, these articles which they reference described informal learning as being held outside of a formal classroom context, including both intentional and incidental learning. Um, basically kind of what I was saying earlier. So uh, informal learning is basically the learning that occurs not in a formal setting or in a formal context, and it can be both intentional and incidental. And so the intent to learn doesn't always have to be there. Um, so uh, yeah, this is kind of the article. Um, and of course, I always leave these in the description. So if you're interested in reading more, um, feel free. Um, but I'm going to go to the next, um, type of learning, which is called formal learning. And I love looking at Google definitions. So, um, according to Google, uh, formal learning is learning that is delivered in a systematic, intentional way. It is planned and guided by an instructor and it usually occurs in a face-to-face -face setting or through an online learning platform like an LMS. I'm not sure what LMS is. Learning. Okay, well, I'll figure that out later. But <laughs> um, here is this like infographic that I thought was also interesting and also might be useful. So um, it kind of separates what informal and formal learning are. So formal learning is structured, goal oriented instructor-led, and the methods are face-to-face -face or online. Um, and informal learning is, sorry, is unplanned, no set goals, and self-directed. And the methods are unplanned, uh, I guess, <laughs> and forms, conversations, online communities, and uh, personal research, online books and resources. So, in a sense, formal learning requires um, 
like collaboration and communication versus informal learning can involve both. It can involve communication and also cannot. Um, and I think that's also just a really interesting tidbit of something that I thought, I'm gonna look at LMS learning management system. Okay, that's what it, that's what this means. So cool, okay. <laughs> Um, now we're going to go to another article here, um, and I will also be going using this article later on in the, in the um, later on in the episode. But I wanted to; they did a really good job at laying out uh, formal and non-formal learning. So, um, in formal learning, how they defined it is that it's generally hierarchic, hierarchic, yeah, based on learning objectives that are organized in linear progressions. Um, and also it is, um, it's tend to stipulate minimum requirements for mandated learner participation. So I'm assuming that means that like there's just a minimum requirement for how many years to attend and um, in a formal system that also incorporates formal learning. So kind of like the traditional setting. Um, and the, uh, where is it? Um, the motivation for formal learning tends to link with the pursuit of external rewards more than less formal learning types. Um, so like getting a grade on, uh, getting an A on a paper or getting an A on an assignment, um, that is like a motivation that's seen much more in formal learning, um, as opposed to other, uh, learning. And then the, also, I don't know where, also though two it's um measured in like where is it oh here measuring measured learning is a part of the evaluation function and it's also used in those formal systems um that's and so like the formal systems usually most likely utilize a formal learning system so um that's kind of also how it's measured in formal learning settings because this article is about the how they research um, types of learning and like what they are. So this is kind of explaining like how everything is defined and also how it's measured, if that makes sense. Um, and then they also uh, heavily focus on propositional rather than procedural knowledge. Um, so basically like the procedural <laughs> knowledge is understanding how to do something versus propositional is how you like just knowing something i think i think that makes sense um because if you think about it in like a classroom the student let's say you're learning about like theory um you're not necessarily learning how to come up with theory you're more so learning how to like like about a theory and so you're not really learning how to kind of like like a procedure so uh yeah that's um that's that's what formal learning is now we're gonna define what non-formal learning is and lots of people first off lots of people think of um informal and not formal learning and they only think of there's of those two um, or they use non-formal learning um, interchangeably. And so there is somewhat like kind of blurred lines between non-formal learning and is it an actual thing? Is it, or is it the same as in, informal learning? Like but in this article, they said that it isn't. So I really wanted to investigate that more because 
I just thought that's pretty interesting. What is not formal learning? And I wanted to educate everybody who also watches this video um, because I think it's important to be educated. So awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I guess, um, uh, where is it? Okay, so it is non-formal learning is systematically planned and structured around learning objectives um and it takes place outside of the compulsory compulsory educational provision not sure what the word means but um it can place take place anywhere so i'm pretty sure these probably do are related i just don't really know any what that word means so awesome um <laughs> And um, also, it's something that I thought was really interesting that I wanted to indicate is that um, about indirect teaching behaviors, um, because what they found about indirect teaching behaviors, I thought was super interesting, especially to me as like a student, because I part of the reason why I love learning so much is because I get to like interact with my educator. Um, sorry. And so that's something that I really wanted to look at more because like that's just something that I find to be really true about my favorite like reason to learn. Um, and so what are indirect teaching behaviors? They're um, non-direct teaching behaviors. Okay, well they're indirect or non-direct. So, okay. They include the teacher's facial expressions, tone of voice, gestures, and so on. And um, the, these researchers note that ITBs are valuable to research investigating the effects of teachers' behaviors on student and social, students' social and moral development. Awesome. I can't read sometimes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, and so in here, they also talk more about um, what ITBs do and what they found was that it was important for promoting positive learning environments, encouraging the development of effective student relationships with peers and motivating the students. Um, part of this positive learning environment was influenced by the teacher's encouragement and caring behaviors, which had an important impact on student engagement. This is important as non-formal learning is often self-directed and involves a degree of student choice and engagement and relies on some other element of intrinsic motivation. The role of ITBs, therefore, are important to consider because they can have an influence on the student motivation and participation in non-formal learning. So basically, what they're saying is non-formal learning because of its informal like self-directed context, ITBs are crucial for increasing student engagement and motivation and participation when it comes to that type of learning. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. I don't know. I, I, I feel like though the one argument that I feel like should be considered or just one question, I guess, is like, do we see think about this question when when I'm telling this information is when you're learning is it only one type of learning or are there multiple different types of learning that you're experiencing when you are learning and yeah that's the question when you're learning do you have a combination of these types of learning or do you see it as one specific type of learning that you're undergoing um so yes that's a question to think about um and also then it uh the non-formal education is aimed at specific groups of learners and observers note that this has two aims one is to educate those that are not currently served by formal education and the other is to encourage social inclusion through targeting specifically marginalized learners so in a sense the non-formal education 
system is has two aims of what it wants to do. It wants to educate those who aren't being educated through the formal education systems and also in socially include and like create a bit a bigger or I guess a stronger sense of belonging within like the educational sphere to those who are marginalized learners um which I think is pretty cool um I'm gonna keep saying pretty cool <laughs> I <laughs> oh god okay I just realized that all right um anyways um there was another one oh here uh so it's t -t 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 it includes a choice and learning components a greater freedom for learners to join or leave an activity called voluntar voluntarism i'm probably saying that wrong of course um and use of assessment to principally inform learning i'm okay anyways uh not formal learning is intentional from the learner's perspective and the motivation for learning may be intrinsic to the learner um so basically as i was talking about before like it's an intrinsic motivation because from the learner's perspective they are intentionally attempting to learn and putting the effort into learning um this is because non-formal learning represents a shift from institutionalized control over knowledge towards individualized control and self-directed learning um so yeah that's kind of that um and then one of the big the final things i wanted to note about non-formal learning is that it has a less focus on cognitive performance and instead has a more balanced emphasis on the intellectual emotional social and behavioral concerns um so basically instead of just solely focusing on the cognitive performance of learners like non-formal learning is engaging to all types of um characteristics of human behavior the intellectual emotional social and behavioral development of those who undergo non-formal learning will be more balanced compared will are like the forms of like measuring too i guess but in a sense like that's the intention of non-formal learning so um i think that's pretty cool because i think that students should be learning those things instead of solely education focusing on their cognitive performance because this is something i've always thought but when you are a teenager you are experiencing a lot of things that involve like your social your emotional and behavior and also your intellect as well and so when i was in high school i was thinking like all these kids know all these things about all these like complex theories or they're really good at math or they know how to do a titration in a chemistry lab or something like that right but i was thinking too like at the same time you're undergoing and learning all that information you are also undergoing a lot of changes with your emotions and your social relationships and like the behaviors and so when when educate when the education system kind of lacks support and education in regards to those areas i think that lessens the ability one to do well and cognitively perform at the best level you can because if you're lacking let's say in the social realm that has implications to your cognitive performance and so i think it's in super important that schools should look at this and consider also implementing courses that consider building emotional skills building social skills and teaching like 
behaviors, if that makes sense. Because if you, when you get to college or when you, yeah, when you get to college, let's say, and you're in high school and you haven't had any experience still with, with like the social aspect, let's say, let's just use the social aspect. Like you're going to go to college and you're going to be overwhelmed because you're going to be all by yourself, most likely, um, unless you peaked in high school and you had roommates um, that you went to high school with. I did not have that. So I did not peak in high school. But <laughs> um, if you if you don't, you're not, you're going to go to college, you're not going to be right anybody. And you didn't have that learning experience of like building social skills, let's say, or like learning like about social, like behave like relationships and things like that, then you're going to have a tough time. And, you know, it's, and I know like some people have, ex like have that taught to them as children, but also too, like there are people who don't grow up in environments that support that type of learning or um they don't have experience like with learning those things so i think like it's important that people should be taught those things should be taught people should be taught about kindness people should be taught about empathy people should be taught about the world and like the things that people go through in order to be more understanding. I, I think like, you know, we as humans, when we spend like a lot of our life, like our early life anyway, in the learning, learning, I think it's important to consider other learning that's other than your cognitive performance, other than your grade on a paper and um you know instead focuses on like you building your human traits because as i said too like if you're lacking in that area then that also is going to translate somehow to your ability to perform so yeah and like i i think like everybody should be required to take a psychology class and take a sociology class i think those are the two things that people should be required to take because that educates you on so many different things and i mean maybe i'm just biased because i love those things so much but i just genuinely think you know you become a better person by learning about that stuff so why not why not it's like it's all right i guess okay that was my whole tangent that i wanted to go on about that so uh thanks for bearing with me um and now we're gonna go to uh learning in traditional environments versus non-traditional settings and for this i'm going to have to um, open another document so i will see you there Alrighty, I, I hope that transition thing was cool maybe it wasn't maybe it was just really lame but um now i'm gonna look at this article here um and this sorry <laughs> um this was written in 2010 and it's a poll mic and if you don't know what a poll mic is let me find a poll mic is a piece of writing expressing a strong critical attack or a controversial opinion about someone or something so um I think this is a controversial view about the death of formal learning. Oh my God. Um, I think the person who wrote this is very um, artistic, the poetic in like the word choice. I, I respect it. Um, so in the article too, a little bit of backstory. Um, the article is talking about um, the article is talking about a transition from uh, traditionally like formal settings of learning to like uh, non formal settings, including the inter like internet and like e learning. Um, and 
they're also considering it in the workspace environment and also the also the educational setting so in both uh learning like for example like training job trainings things like that but also too in like the educational system and the educational setting so yeah i digress um so the first i i color coded these um parts of the article so first i'm going to be talking about the shift and what what they found about the shift and um they were talking about how in traditional settings um they have it involves a passive transfer of knowledge from the instructor to the student with a limited involvement of the student within the overall learning process and so in a sense they're saying that in traditional settings um students have a very little involvement in the learning process um because it's just like a passive relationship of or transfer of knowledge which they're using from the instructor to the student so i guess they're probably thinking of when you're sitting in a lecture hall and you're listening to the professor talk and it's just like words i guess and they're just being said and then you're just passively listening to it i think that's kind of what they're saying which i personally disagree with um but i'm just going to continue with what they're saying but i disagree with this because um it's not students actually don't have minimal uh involvement or limited involvement in their like the learning process i think they have a significant lear in like role in the learning process because um you are the learner yourself as a student and so too some of one of my favorite sayings um that i say to myself is effort works magic and the student is putting the effort into like learning and that's when learning occurs it's not like a passive thing between a professor because the student has to be engaged it is it's passive on the professor's part it's professor on the instructor's sorry instructor's part because they are just spreading the information um and so in within the learning process, I think the student has a far more in, like involvement than what they're saying. And I think it's the opposite of what they're saying, really. Um, that by no means says, says that the instructor has no in involvement in the learning process, but the instructor has, has the involvement in the educating process, not the learning process. Um, and those two are like intertwined with each other because educating equates to learning and learning then equates to educating because then you educate other people. So it's like a whole circle. So anyways, that was a whole thing. <laughs> um, can, and then they talk about um, how, I guess, oh, in the newer, in the new contemporary approach to learning is that students are expected to become aware and evaluate their own experience and where the instructor is no longer an oracle but a guide who participates in learning um so yeah this as i was saying the author whoever wrote this is very poetic i think um which is appreciated and i think it's cool that they use it but um yeah i don't know i just i don't really have an opinion about that but if you do uh feel free to let me know <laughs> um and so then i guess the choice is not a simple binary um choice to make when it comes to learning approaches i'm not reading from the text by the way um <laughs> but it's effective now i am by a complex range of cognitive, personal, historical, social, and emotional factors. And it's vital to critically evaluate the significant effect that these changes of the learning processes 
um, have brought about and outlined the implications for in educational um, organizations and society as a whole. So that's kind of the overview of like the shift from traditional to contemporary learning um, approaches. So yeah, um, that's all I guess I really have to say. I guess the uh, one thing though is like, um, I just think the reason, the reason, well, it's just overall, it's just important to understand and evaluate things and understand the implications between or like the implications and the consequences of both sides, you know, the pros and cons of everything. Um, sorry. Okay. So next, we're going to go to um, the e learning and what they say about e learning and its relation to the slow death of formal learning. Um, so here is their first proposition that the increased use of technology is slowly leading to a significant changes in program design and delivery in education and the workspace. Of course, we're just talking about education here. Um, but I mean, we guess we can, but I'm just more so gonna focus on that. So um, here they're saying that the arguing, the argument, or whoa, 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 I can't read. Um, so basically there are, there are concerns with e-learning and like what the transition from formal to non-formal like learning and how like the implications of that. Uh, I had this previously highlighted, but it says just basically technology is now a driving force. Um, not like in workplace training, but also in education. Um, here it says the information of information and communication has altered the pattern of training and education delivery in both organizational and educational settings. So basically it's just talking about how technology has changed stuff. This then gets into the arguments of like um, technology being bad, technology bad. Um, for formal learning, not bad, but it's just in the context of this article, the POTIC. Um, first, they also say though, e-learning programs have been cost-effective, flexible, and alternatives. Um, and however, though there are concerns about the quality and effectiveness about e-learning programs, um, so this is like first an issue of the quality and effectiveness the quality is is it a quality program that's being utilized to help people learn and how effective is it at cre helping people learn um so that's kind of like a question that's kind of a question and a concern that people have about e-learning um here they say, within the educational setting, research indicates that learners have a completely new set of expectations and requirements to provide generations being technologically literate, high mobile, autonomous individuals with short attention spans and are more inclined to question authority. Um, I don't know if this was like a little jab at the people of today or tomorrow because I feel like here they're saying that the learners of today are different than the previous generations because they're technology they are more technologically literate highly mobile autonomous individuals with short attention spans and are inclined to question authority. Um, and so, I don't know, uh, do I have a short attention span? Yes, but it's because I have ADHD. Um, am I inclined to question authority? Um, if it's my parents, 
<laughs> uh, that was a joke. But no, that's not the main point of what I highlighted here, though. The, the main reason why I highlighted it is that the implementation of online learning or like e-learning is the term they're using, is that it requires people to, it, it transitions, creates a transition of expectations and requirements that the people who are utilizing those types of learning have to like meet. They have to meet the expectation of being technologically literate um, is the most important one. Um, and they just, ha it's caused like a total shift of like the individuals of today and how they learn and like what kind of standards are they being held to today compared to others, uh, the previous generations. Um, and I just thought that was a nice thing to consider, even though he or the uh, people, the authors, um, kind of put a little, put a little salt on the wound. Um, I don't know. Anyways, um, yeah. So the final thing I wanted to discuss about this was that he um, argues that um, that technology-based approaches to learning uh, free learners from the rigid schedules and physical limitations resulting in control being given back to the learner and the however here the uh instructor it the instructors are should challenge should be challenged to truly understand the nature and potential of e-learning and cautions that e-learning should not be treated as infotainment so basically summary of this is that technology-based uh, learning gives the control back to the learner and gives them the power to control like what they're learning how they learn etc but also on the same note uh instructors have to understand they have to truly in order for it to be effectively implemented and effectively used the instructors need to truly understand the nature and potential and also acknowledge the potential negatives um, that e-learning should not be treated as infotainment. And infotainment, from my understanding of what kind of, what they might be saying is infotainment is basically like you are, it's not education and like the learning aspect of e-learning or technology-based learning um, shouldn't be a form of entertainment because when you are let's say you're like watching a movie uh that's a form of entertainment and yet are you like physically engaged in the movie are you like putting effortful action into watching the movie most likely not you're probably just sitting there looking at the screen and just staring Maybe sometimes you'll have a thought of why the hell did the character do this? But other than that, other than that I think that, um, yeah, it's a very passive uh, activity. So in the sense of infotainment, they should be concerned about whether or not they're creating infotainment. Are they creating an process where the student who is trying to learn is just passively engaging with the material um, as opposed to being physically engaged with it or mentally engaged with it um, so it shouldn't be it shouldn't be a form of entertainment it should be a form of learning um, so that's kind of what I got from it um, so yeah <laughs> um, next we're gonna be discussing um the the inhibitors to the implementation of technology within the educational setting and like sphere um because obviously i think the last episode i was talking about that too um but i also wanted this is also something to consider too when it comes to learning so yeah um so yes here it says there are so, still exists some resistance in 
use of technology in promoting learning amongst employees and students. This is kind of what they're saying. Um, some of the thing, or one of the things, oh, these are the things I highlighted, obviously, that are what I want to talk about. But in educational settings, the inhibitors uh, lie at the individual level. And one of those is that some establishments of education do not have the resources to keep up with the latest technological trends. So they're not able to afford utilizing those modes of learning and for like their students. And so they're not able to like engage with that and not utilize the forms of online learning that could open, um, that could open the opportunities for better learning. They don't have enough money um, or resources. Um, and then another one is that it also is, um, there are reluctance among educators to move away from the sole reliance on traditional teaching because online learning requires the uh, or may may open the educator up to a greater challenge, um, and that is forcing them to adopt a supportive role versus a directive role. And this is something that I find also interesting because, because I think, I mean, I'm not an educator. I'm not a professor. I'm not somebody who's in the field. But I can speak from experience that my the educators that I learned the most from, the educators that I enjoyed the most were the educators who were supportive of me, of my learning, both of those things. Um, and so I could see how some people view education as solely directive and um, that, you know, there is authority. There are, uh, educators do have authority over students. However, I think there are more opportunities to, for learning if you break down those barriers um, as opposed to keeping them up because when you keep it up, you, you are lessening your ability to actually teach a student, I think, because, you know, you could have a professor who just reads off the slides, or you could have a professor who is, like, shows, like, their true, like, colors, and, like, shows that they really care about their professors, or their students, shows that they're really passionate, and kind of, it dissolves, like, the authoritarian, authority it doesn't completely dissolve it but it lessens like the perception of authority and you know authority can be quite um like overwhelming for some people not overwhelming that's the wrong word but kind of like a barrier for like learning in itself i think it's like out of fear authority i feel like sometimes anyway like instills fear versus like connection i think opens up more opportunities so yeah anyways so that's um another inhibitor is because people are just reluctant to uh adopt more supportive roles and would rather be directive instead um next up we're going to talk about the criticisms of informal learning so um one of the things that I was like interested in too within this article because obviously formal learning is like kind of what they're talking about in the article. So obviously they're going to talk about informal learning and what are the criticisms of it? Because I think the authors are kind of upset by the death of formal learning. That's kind of my perception of what this article is about. So they're going to criticize it. And I want to know their criticism so that you can combat them. Or not combat them, but refute them. Re I think that's the right word. 
you know what I mean. Um, so, uh, despite widespread acceptance, um, there are several criticisms. I'm only going to go over a few what they go over because um, I just, I want to get to like the meat and bones. <laughs> but um, they, they're, the, are, there's the argument that it's, um, it needs to be supported by formal learning and it's not sufficient by itself to um, for the acquisition of knowledge. <clears throat> um, so basically, there's arguments that say that if you are solely utilizing informal learning, like that's not going to be, that's not going to cut it for like actually teaching. And I mean, sorry, that's actually, that's not going to cut it for actually learning things and acquiring knowledge. Um, so you'll need a formal, you also need formal learning to also support the informal learning. Um, so that's, um, I keep, I'm sorry, I keep yawning. Um, then, um, then they also argue that informal learning can leave individuals feeling helpless and directionless. He argues, Conlon, he argues that unless individuals have access to learning or educational support to provide direction, a sink or swim approach can cause feelings of anger and frustration. Um, this can be caused by a lack of teamwork, poor cooperation, and it lead, result in a destructive environment where the performance and morale of individuals are affected. So um, I can see this argument. I can see an argument for informal learning for this, for from Conlon's perspective, um, because I know, like, if I don't have that support, um, I and I get stuck on something. Um, sometimes this actually was me before. Now it's not anymore. But I'm gonna talk about that later. Um, but I can see how students who lack like that support and lack that direction from either like the people around them or just like internally are not intrinsically motivated, um, they get angry and frustrated that they can't learn. And so, you know, this causes lots of stress too, especially I think in like a when you're in a formal like educational system, a traditional education system, because if you don't have that support or that direction, but you're still being like graded on stuff, but you just don't know how to ask for help, you you feel helpless, like then you're gonna get frustrated, then you're gonna give up, then you're gonna, like it's kind of like depression, the learned helplessness by um, Beck, Aaron Beck. I think that's, I think Aaron Beck created that. Anyways, um, it's like a, I, it's like a loop. That's actually gonna bother me if I don't know exactly what it is. Um, No, it wasn't. It wasn't back. It was Seligman's. But also, maybe it was back too. Grr, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was Seligman, not, not Aaron Beck. Okay, sorry about that. I just wanted to know. <laughs> um, anyways, um, it can be like a little feedback loop of like not feeling like you can do it, not feeling like you are capable of learning it, and that's like frustrating and angry and you feel so helpless and you're like, oh my God, I can't do it. Um, so yeah, I can definitely see an argument for that. But I think, you know, it just all 
kind of relates to like the implementation of it. How well are students supported? And if not, if you are teaching and a uh, virtual like class or whatnot, how well do you support your students? How, how supported do your students feel? Because I think that's also going into it because you might have all these support, like you might be super supportive, but how supported do the students actually feel? How, or are they feeling isolated? Um, how much direction do you give to your students? Things like that, I think are just really important things to consider um, because you know, when you don't, like then that leads to negative consequences. So yeah, um, now we're gonna look at the conclusion or the conclusion that I, whoa, what is going on? Um, okay. Okay, this is the conclusion. This is the whole conclusion, but, oh my gosh. Okay, but I'm just gonna look at the, the part of the conclusion that I thought was relevant. So here in conclusion, the pressure to embrace technology and e-learning platforms to achieve competitive advantage has resulted in significant shifts in how training and education is delivered to employees and students. Formal learning has become branded as outdated delivery mode associated with an old fashioned antiquated pedagogy GD for learning um, through the implementation of measures designed to foster accessibility, flexibility, modularization, informal learning have become institutionalized and traditional form methods are relegated and marginalized. In moving forward, we should recall the teachings of Thomas Sowell, who remarked that much social history over the past three decades has involved replacing what worked with what sounded good. So in conclusion, these people think that replacing formal learning approaches with, or sorry, re replacing formal learning with informal learning uh, is no good. And that we should stick to what we know um, because uh, even though these designs about the n informal learning are, there are benefits to it, but they're not sure about whether or not does it actually work. And also to how formal learning shouldn't become diminished in favor of uh, informal learning. So that's the conclusion. Um, and next we're going to go to, uh, what I'm going to be talking about next which is how to improve learning overall. So I will get back to that document. Alrighty. So basically now we're going to go back to the document that I was showing you guys a little bit about before, and we're going to talk about how to improve learning. Um, so do to do, I forget where I put it on where I found this on the document, but I'm pretty sure it must be the conclusion. So we're gonna go there. Yep, I was right, okay. So in conclusion, mind you, just a reminder about what this article is about is how, what is formal, non-formal and informal learning and how do you research uh, those types of learning and then I am relating it to like for how you measure that type of learning can also be important for how you implement it you know so um here the authors say that informal and non-formal learning is complex and powerful um and they create attention for cur curriculum thinking curriculum thinking I'm is just formal learning uh, curriculum, um, just for context. Narrow concepts of curriculum leave little space to consider the unplanned and implicit, implicit aspects of learning, which can be a component 
of non-learning in schools. Um, so basically, like having a narrow concept of what learning is um, leaves little space for acknowledging the other types of learning that also occur that are implicit and unplanned within learning process as well. So it's important to consider the learning that you are doing when you're not filling out math problems, the learning you're doing instead, like perfecting the number five but you're not like planning you're not purposely doing that so that's kind of an example i guess i don't know if that example was good but maybe it was i don't know um anyways then this also means that that um educational research and i'm considering an education as a whole needs to adopt a broad concept of curriculum in order to better understand learning and also leverage all types of learning so learners and society can reach their full potential. Um, so that's something that I thought was important and how to improve learning because basically it's important to implement all types of learning into learning. The question I asked earlier was, when you are learning something, are you learning it in one way or are you learning it in a bunch of different ways? <clears throat> and so I'm answering that question now for myself anyways, like when you are learning, you're doing it in an informal, formal and non-formal context. And all of these things combined are what make learning. And you can learn something in a formal context, whilst also learning it in a non-formal context and continuously building different skills and different capabilities and talents and things like that. Um, and in order to be an effective learner, I think it's important to acknowledge that and like utilize that knowledge, you know, utilize the knowledge that you know how to do things and you can do it by um, implementing all those types of learning into your own learning experience and also that it should be implemented in into uh educational systems in curriculums so that's kind of that's that's the conclusion of that that's how you improve learning now we're going to talk about how humans are biological learners um and the first thing i wanted to discuss is um how to is an article written or uh, published in Cambridge, which discussed um, how to increase learning capacity uh, through neuroscience. Um, here's the author of the article um, and a summary, stupid ads. Um, the summary of how, how the human brain has a, learn, oh, has a way of learning and how and how to like understand it because it helps us teach. But because this podcast is about learning, I'm usually, I'm just focusing on the learning aspect. So first off, um, it's important to acknowledge that the brain can be educated and that those who educate can only educate well if they understand how the brain works. Um, and both of the premises are at the root of this of this uh, saying, the brain learns better if we respect its learning conditions. So the first thing is that um, there is constant communication between the cerebral cortex, which is a rational part of the brain, and the limbic system where emotions develop. So the limbic system is the emotional part of the brain and the cerebral cortex is irrational. And in humans, these are interacting continuously and there's constantly communication between the two. So this means that our emotions, our limbic system constantly influences our learning. And by strengthening this communication, you can improve one's learning. And so I think that's important to acknowledge because, you know, I think 
this is straight up facts, but you like, if you really love something, learning it is like super exciting, right? Like you're like, I love learning this. I would, I don't know about you, but I get hyper fixated on stuff. So I, when I learn something new, if I learn how to do something, I will like spend like hours like doing it because it's like rewarding to me and super fun. Maybe I'm just weird like that, but um, I really enjoy like doing the things that I love and I love, I love learning too. So like I will spend hours just doing my own informal learning of looking at articles and reading them and trying to decipher and coming with my own theories for all these things. I love creating my own theories about the world. And so, um, yes, I think that it's just important to acknowledge the fact that we, the way we learn or how we learn is also influenced by our emotions. So it's important to consider, you know, if you, if you are upset, then maybe you're not in the right headspace to space to learn. But also I think institutions can, should also consider that. And that's why mental health days should be uh, important and implemented into the educational like system. Because if you are an institution of learning, of education of learning, then you should consider this connection between emotion and learning and how our emotions impact our ability to learn and support students who might be struggling um, emotionally so that maybe they're in a better space to learn mentally you know and then of course you know who you know why those systems like aren't always implemented because people always take advantage of them and people always take advantage of systems that are made to support people who actually need them and instead are utilized to to their own betterment when somebody needs that and then it gets taken away all because people take advantage of those things and so i'm just extremely disappointed that you know there are people like that out in the world but i can't do anything about it and that's not even relevant to what i'm talking about but that was just another side thought so that's fine <laughs> um and then the next thing I want to talk about is like the ability to learn and like there's two different things that go into learning. So in the more biological sorry, in the more biological um like the more biological sense, uh the myelination of neurons, uh psychology one oh one here um, the myelin sheath, what myelination is, is just the myelin sheath forming and like growing on a neuron. So like the myelin sheath is what surrounds the neuron, if that makes sense. Like it goes around it. And then how that works then is it increases the amount of the speed of which the information from one neuron to another, or like one synapse to another, like a cell is transferred to another one. And so when there's more myelin, the signal is strengthened and can go faster and quicker versus if they're, like when you're older, the uh, myelin sheet uh, is lessened or in neurons, like brain, like brain, they, like when, when you don't use a specific like neural pathway, then that also like is diminished. But besides the point, like um, also same thing when there's less then it's slower. So like the myelination of neurons is what helps learning and helps learning like continuous learning and like if you, of course, that's something that we can't really control. So, but it's important to consider. The second thing is that you, also human brains are able to 
like adapt and change is like neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity involves learning because neuroplasticity, as it says here, the capacity of the brain to adapt, allowing it to be modified after acquiring new forms of learning. And so basically neuroplasticity is helps besides, you know, the myelination, the neuroplasticity helps form new skills and and helps you learn because you are capable of changing your mind and you can you're capable of changing and learning things continuously because of neuroplasticity and you know our our brains we're younger like they're very they have lots of plasticity and as we get older there's less but there is constantly consistently like you can still change your mind and you can still change your brain even though you might not be able to like do it as easily it's still capable you're still you still have the capacity to do so it just takes more effort later on in life than when you're younger but people should still be wanting to change and wanting to do better for themselves so yeah that's that's uh one thing else something else and then they have other ones too that direct impact le impact learning um but i'm just gonna go um that's i just want to go to the next article because that is also relevant to our biological factors of learning which is learning expands the brain's capacity to store information and this was published by the University of Texas at Austin um, and I found basically look at this this is a neuron isn't it so cool I think it's cool <laughs> um, okay anyways so basically they were like doing brain scans and like how to understand how learning like alters brain structures and like alters the synapses, which is just so cool. Um, so yeah, anyways, um, the act of learning causes connections between brain cells called synapses to expand their capacity to store information and, and to store information. Yeah. So um basically like when you learn stuff you are expanding your capacity to store information like your brain cells are like your literal the cells in your brain are learning how to expand and like store that information and like better like the ability they're better their ability to store the information and or like yeah so that's really cool because your brain's constantly just like helping you out with learning um anyways <laughs> um where is it here so in a region uh necessary for long-term memory called the hippocampal dendate gyrus uh, they discovered that learning causes some synapses to grow and others to shrink, creating a wider range of synapse sizes. The synapse size correlates with the strength of signals it can, can, it can transmit between the brain cells and the amount of information it can store. So basically, when you learn something, the synapses within the hippocampal dentate gyrus um, are either growing or shrinking and so there's a tons of different variety in the sizes of those synapses and like the bigger synapses they have a stronger ability to a stronger signal that can transmit between the brain cells and also the amount of information it can store but the thing is is you would think then like the, the shrinking of the other synapses is bad but actually it's not as bad as you think. Um, here they said they expected all the synapses to get bigger because when you learn things get bigger, right? But the other ones have to shrink. 
So, here they say, some synapses had to shrink in order for others to grow. Um, so this, though, is actually kind of crazy, is that how, when you are learning something, like, yeah, some of the synapses are shrinking, but that, the synapse doesn't completely die, and instead your brain is becoming even more connected to each other because the synapse that grows is somehow connected to the smaller synapse because it's all within the same area so instead you're just increasing the connectivity between all those brain cells and the ability for it to transport all that information because like there's like you just are you you might be growing like like a few and having them shrink but it's still the area in itself is becoming more connective and the connectivity within that area is just increasing so therefore you're not actually experiencing any deficit when you learn stuff obviously you would think but i don't know i thought that was pretty cool i hope i explained that pretty all right um but yeah here they say that uh, the keeping the overall signal strength the same during learning, but spread all over a wider range of synapse sizes might ex help explain right never before answered questions about how the connections in the brain work together to provide or to support memory. So here, um, how new experiences can be stored in the brain while maintaining over stability. So basically, like kind of literally what I was just saying. Like, it's just super cool, and this is this really awesome research. Um, so props to the University of Texas at Austin, and also, I guess, the University of Otago in New Zealand. But that was pretty cool. Also, the Stock Institute for Biological Sciences. But the University of Texas published it, so let's go. Um, so, yeah, anyways, I just thought that was really cool. That was one of my favorite things about this, like, doing my research for this episode. Um, now we're also going to talk about lifelong learners because I think part of the biological aspect of a human brain is being a lifelong learner. Um, so yeah, um, I just found this website, they cool infographics. So, um, so yeah, anyways, um, The building I live in is old and I keep hearing banging. I hope that doesn't disrupt this. Um, so lifelong learning, like what is it? You know, I mean, we can all kind of assume what it is, but like lifelong learning is just a part of like what it means to be human. Oh my gosh, this is what they said. Um, we have a natural curiosity and we're natural learners. We develop and grow thanks to our ability to learn. Like, lifelong learning recognizes that not all our learning comes from a classroom. Lifelong learning is just like what it means to be a human. It's part of the human nature. It's part of the human uh, existence. I don't know if I'm using that word right, but like we're all, we're all lifelong learners and so it's just important to keep that in mind when you are learning something you know um here's a key checklist for lifelong learning it is voluntary self-motivated or self-initiated doesn't always require a cost often informal self-taught or instruction that is sought and motivation is out of personal interest or personal development. So as you can see here, what is in lifelong learning sounding a little similar to? Um, the word is kind of right there, informal, informal learning. Um, lifelong learning is a form of informal learning. Um, and therefore, you know, the people who are anti-formal, or sorry, anti-informal learning 
are failing to recognize that, you know, if you want somebody to be fully engaged in the learning process and like want to continuously learn, the formal way of learning is not going to cut it. So I digress. And now they're vacuuming outside my room. Lovely. Okay, Dougie, I think they're done vacuuming outside my room. So um, now I can continue recording my podcast but as i was saying that individuals who fail to recognize that formal learning does not necessarily encourage a lifelong learning process i think that you know it's important to combine all these things together um basically what i was saying but uh now we're gonna discuss the impact of technology on lifelong learning because as I was just saying that the informal learning is connected with the like like what is lifelong learning and you know how I was just saying how like formal learning doesn't always equate to um equate to lifelong learning but like you know there is ways of formal learning through technology but also like that also promote lifelong learning because, you know, technology, I think, has the ability to implement a lot of different structures and things and how it's utilized, I think, can benefit versus it is harder in like a traditional setting with the in-person traditional setting to find, um, to, to support lifelong learning. Um, okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look for, okay, yeah, I guess a little background, a little background on this article is this article, um, is written to talk about how technology influences lifelong learning and how that necessarily, how that goes hand in hand, um, and utilizing sorry utilizing a scientific approach they kind of dive into this information i'm going to take a little peek at some of the information um and kind of point out some things that i thought were relevant to what i'm discussing in this podcast um and so yeah uh, that's kind of what i'm going to be talking about but um Okay, so where is it? Where is what I'm gonna talk about? Um, uh, I'm gonna find it, you know. Okay, here. Here we go. Okay, I guess that makes sense. I found it under learning interface and education system because obviously that's what's pretty relevant to what I'm talking about when it comes to technology supporting lifelong learning. So lifelong learning interacts with a multiple digital interfaces that enable the growth or the development of a skill set allowing for job advancement and educational and other personal growth. Um, so basically, lifelong learning in the digital realm helps promote like a bunch of different skills, helps people develop a bunch of skills, helps people get better jobs and be more um, like skilled for a job and also has educational and personal elements of growth that can also be seen here they say massive open online courses social media um, and ted talk google classroom zoom and other learning management systems are all available as part of the ecosystem of lifelong learning involvement with technology I really, really liked this sentence because it encapsulates what we've discussed previously, MMOCs, 
It discussed social media and it discussed the learning management systems that are used and all saying how it works together to create an ecosystem of lifelong learning and its involvement with technology. I just really liked that. Um, and something like that I um, thought of when we were talking about lifelong learning and um, the digital realm and like technology is I thought back to the article that was shared to us um, in unit two. Here is the assignment, easier seen than done. Um, and they say that the more people merely watch others perform, the more they nonetheless believe that they could perform a skill too. However, they do not improve after merely watching others. Um, and I thought that this was pretty relevant because, you know, lifelong learning, how does that entail, like, you know, what they were saying about how YouTube is something that's involved with lifelong learning and the, and technology. But, but this article is saying that just by watching a YouTube video, you can't necessarily learn something. Um, and I think there's a lot more, though, that goes into the aspect of lifelong learning and technology. Um, I think it's just, it's not as cut as we all would imagine it to be. Um, I think that um, there is a much more complex thing that's going on here. Hence why I found this video um, that I believed helped kind of bridge the two together. Because yes, YouTube, watching YouTube videos is not going to help you learn stuff, like, or help you, not necessarily help you learn stuff, but help you, like, accomplish something, right? And, and become, like, a lifelong learner. But at the same time, practice can. And so I wanted to show this video um, because I thought this was super relevant. And this is not an ad. We're not going to look at the ad. We're not going to look at the ad because I'm not going to, I'm not going to save the ad. So anyways, here is a video uh, that I found um, that was published by the University of California Television. Um, and Greg Ashby um, is giving a discussion about the remarkable learning abilities of the human brain. So. So for example, if you um, are practicing a behavior and the first time you do the behavior, you get the correct response, you get positive feedback, then the cortical network synapses that were active are gonna get strengthened. But then on the next trial, if you make an error, the cortical synapses that, that mediate that error are also gonna get strengthened. So you're not gonna be able to learn to inhibit that behavior in the future. So our hypothesis was that uh, the, the role of these learning systems is to train up these cortical cortical networks that are highly efficient. And the way the training works is that the subcortical networks will activate the correct postsynaptic target in motor cortex. And then because of that extra activation by the, by the learning network, you're going to have more activity at the correct synapse than at the incorrect synapse. And so there'll be more strengthening at the correct synapse than the incorrect synapse. And then eventually that's going to allow the system, the cortical system to uh, emit the correct behaviors without the help of the subcortical network. Alrighty, yes. So that's the video that I thought kind of related to this because here it kind of provides more evidence for the study without actually practicing but people merely watch and they think they can but here he is saying like you need to practice and the more you practice the more feedback that your brain gets and the more feedback your brain gets you continuously learn what 
is the correct behavior and what is the incorrect behavior. Um, here I say, we learn by doing, we learn by doing. Um, so yes, I just wanted to point that out because, um, you know, that part of the article was really pretty interesting to me. Um, now we're going to continue. Um, and I am here. Yes. So here it more so talks about the skills developed. Um, using new technology and digital literacies fosters an effective learning environment and develops new skills, which is critical to the LLL process. If you guys haven't noticed already, LLL stands for lifelong learning. Um, I just so you know. Um, and so here they are saying that use by using technology and digital literacies, you are fostering an effective learning environment that is critical to the lifelong learning process. And the internet and the utilization of the internet and how the learning process occurs via technology is supportive of the lifelong learning process because if with technology and all these digital literacies we can support that we can implement things that help us develop skills and that are like that in involve the lifelong learning process i hope i'm saying that right i don't know i don't know um here in conclusion to this is the final um, part of what I really, really thought that this kind of tied everything together of what I've been saying, is that the effects of lifelong learning on society and how it interacts with technology can improve social inclusion, active citizenship, individual growth, competitiveness, and employability. That is something that I really think is cool because the ability for technology and the internet to implement thing, ways that lifelong learning can occur can help see more benefit the more benefits the benefits of lifelong learning and those are just like a few of them but the internet can cultivate that more because the internet can allow more people to engage in lifelong learning um and then they say that although skilled learners do develop specific employable traits, if the curriculum is not designed with particular principles, then lifelong learning will not be engaging and motivating to students to achieve these 21st century competencies. Basically, as I was saying, these competencies, this, the learning, like if you are not implementing the principles that cultivate lifelong learning, then lifelong learning won't occur and it won't, it won't help the students engage and learn and like develop those skills that come along with lifelong learning. And so that's why it's important to implement it in a, in the best way um, and implement and try and and that's what the technology can help uh, help accomplish because in a traditional setting lifelong learning isn't always encouraged in the traditional setting lifelong learning isn't a, a crucial aspect to it but utilizing technology lifelong learning is a crucial aspect to utilizing technology and informal learning and non-formal learning like lifelong learning is a part of it and that cultivates these skills that contribute to the betterment of society and positively impact it and also positively impact the individual and the learner. And so technology in itself can be utilized for all these great things um, when it comes to learning. So yeah. Um, then the last thing I wanted to talk about is a personal story of mine. Um, this is an article I had to write. Well, I didn't have to, I did have to write it for an assignment, but I really wanted to. Um, and this story is about my experience with learning and what happened 
and what motivated me to learn and why why do i love learning so much now um so this story talks about my previous experiences with learning and and what really motivated me um so i will read this uh, mrs kraus was uh, my te one of my teachers in high school, um, she taught me geometry um, in, when I was a sophomore, um, which is so many years ago now, wow. But um, yeah, she really changed my life. So uh, here's the story. The far back corner is where I sat every day during the first semester of 10th grade geometry. Ever since fifth grade, I thought mathematics would be somewhere where I I struggled. While being passed back test after test, D plus, F, D minus, F, F, D, that thought dug deeper into my mind. The football player sitting next to me berated me whenever I, he'd see the letter on the top of my paper. How could anyone be that stupid? You're an idiot. I was nervous for a second, for my second semester as a dark figure named Failure tapped me on the shoulder. As I walked into my second semester of geometry class, I accepted my fate. However, to my surprise, I'd been assigned the desk adjacent to Ms. Mrs. Kraus. I had her during my first semester and assumed she saw me just as I saw myself, hopeless. At first I was embarrassed. I almost failed her class last semester, and now she'd see me fail my second semester. However, Mrs. Krause was persistent and patient. A small woman with a strong demeanor. Whenever I had a question, she helped me understand, no matter how many times she had to repeat herself. When she saw me struggling, she'd reassure me and explain. I'd felt like a burden, but she didn't make me feel that way. She believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. No one so, knowing someone cared enough to put so much of their time and effort into me helped me realize that I could exceed my own expectations. Good job, Katie. Her sincere voice spoke as I saw a smile on her face. She passed back my quiz with a circled A on top along with a smiley face. My heart raced, my body in complete shock. This is my test? I must have gotten lucky this time, no way. Throughout the semester, my suspicion turned into confidence as I was handed back test after test. A, A minus, A, B plus, B, A plus. I couldn't believe the drastic improvement along with my excitement about math, the subject I dreaded for years. I worked hard and I studied for hours every night. Mrs. Krause made me excited to learn because her classroom felt like a home, a place where I could express myself and be encouraged. She helped me realize I was capable of academic success as well as achieving my future aspirations. Ever since, I've never been the same student or person. I've watched myself turn from an average student to an exceptional one, a magical feeling. She helped me develop my passion for learning and taught me to never give up on what I want to achieve. She rescued me from what seemed to be a spiraling downfall of negativity and guided me upwards towards my dreams. Whenever I'm in my lowest moments of self-doubt, I remind myself of her. I never go a day without thinking about Mrs. Krause, one of the most dedicated teachers at Arrowhead High School, who completely changed my life. So, um, that personal story of mine um, I wrote for an assignment, but Mrs. Krause really did change my life. And I think it relates to this, uh, podcast episode because I, um, think, you know, what they were talking about, uh, when it comes to the ITBs, um, the teaching behaviors, like, have such a strong influence on one's confidence to learn and, and how they feel about learning because, you know, when I'm sitting, when I was sitting in the back of the classroom and the kid next to me would call me stupid every day and just overall was not a great experience. I'm sitting in the back. My, I, I'm, I love that my last name is Zimmerman. <laughs> um, and 
I'm not paying attention because I'm sitting all the way in the back. I don't need to pay attention. Like, I just am like, whatever. But after that, you know, after she sat me in the front of her classroom, after she paid attention to me, after she motivated me, after she was persistent in helping me and supported me, then I gained that confidence and I I saw myself not as a burden. I didn't see myself as stupid anymore. I saw myself capable of doing the things that I wanted to do and capable of doing more than what I thought I could do. I thought I wasn't going to do anything. I thought I was like a failure, just as the figure who's tapping me on the shoulder. But but Mrs. Krause didn't see me that way. And, you know, it just takes one person to believe in you and to see you for not what you see yourself as and see you as something better. And that one person can substantially change your whole life trajectory. I know it changed mine. If Mrs. Krause never believed in me, and never supported me, I don't know if I would be here. And so um, I genuinely appreciate that. And that's why I also think that's why it's important for learning. Learning needs to involve that sense of connection and that sense of motivation. And I think uh, educators can really um, have a positive impact on that. So so everybody um now is the time for the t l d r not the t r well, i can't i'm not even gonna mess myself up with that one now it's time for the t l d l d r oh my god t l d r t l d r t l d r t l d r too long didn't read um so today's episode we went over the three types of learning the formal, non formal, and informal learning. Um, then we discuss the death of traditional learning and whether or not if it's true. Um, and in that article we read, we talked about how the shift from traditional to non traditional or formal to non formal has um, created new concerns and challenges. First is is the pa- is is considering whether or not the passive versus in, uh, active envir- environment of like the learning process is it the teacher versus the taught the implications that it has on organizations institutions and society how does that impact those two things um, how does that shift impact those two things. Second, we talked about the concerns about e learning. And that is in regard to its effectiveness and quality. I did I I don't even know why. Okay, uh, the effectiveness and quality, um, and that learners are met with these new expectations that they weren't before, uh, which is being technologically literate, highly mobile, and autonomous. Um, and we can disregard the short attention spans and inclination to question authority. Um, Then we also talked about how technology offers more flexible learning methods and how it gives the learner back the control on on their learning experience and breaks them free from that structure and the physical limitations that come along with formal learning. But it also is important for instructors to be to understand the nature and potential of e-learning in order to effectively implement it and utilize it, and also be aware that it shouldn't be transformed into infotainment, because that then impacts the passivity of the learning experience and whether or not that is a passive or active experience and and uh, approach to learning. Then. Um, there have been inhibitation inhibitors to the the adoption of technology within the educational realm is that that lots of places do not have the resources to keep up with the trends and the technology that is needed to implement these things and it also forces educators uh, because ed- educators are resisted resisting uh, the challenge of becoming supportive instead of directive and that transition from a directive to a tr- supportive role makes them not comfortable and makes them resist 
the adoption of technology. But as I was saying, support, I think, is important when it comes to education. Then they also criticized informal learning, and they said that uh, informal learning is not sufficient by itself to um, for one to acquire knowledge um, and that it not must be supported by formal learning. And secondly, informal learning can uh, induce feelings of helplessness and anger and directionlessness um, because somebody might not have access to the support that they need um, when it comes to receiving education or learning. And so it's a swing or swim, sink or swim mindset and they get angry and frustrated. Um, then we talked about how to improve learning. And we talked about how having a narrow concept of formal learning of the curriculum leaves little space for implementing like the benefits of unplanned and implicit learning. And so a school um, learning should implement all different types of learning so that the learning and society can work on fulfilling their potential. So um, people should find ways to combine all the concepts of learning, the formal, the non-formal, and the informal in order to improve the learning process. Then, I don't even, okay. Um, then we talked about humans being designed to learn and humans being like the blueprint for how to learn and what like the creature that is destined to learn uh this is because um you know we are biologically created to learn so therefore you can't really avoid it um so the first thing we talked about was the communication between the cerebral cortex and the limbic system always being continuous and always having our learning is having our learning influenced by our emotion because of this interconnectivity. Um, while we're born to be innate learners and we have the innate functions that support the natural ability to learn, which is the myelination of neurons, we also are capable of continuing this learning process through the neuroplasticity. Um, and neuroplasticity allows us to learn things even beyond um, our key developmental years. Um, secondly, the brain is talented. The synapse connections within the brain will work together to support memory. And as synapses grow and shrink, the brain still continues to improve its interconnectivity. And this process of learning can help, like, uh, increases the ability of that area of, like, of the brain that's responsible for that area. It becomes more interconnected and becomes more, like, strengthened in the ability to learn and also just utilize that information. So even though synaptic connections are growing or shrinking, the brain the, through the learning process is still in, in growing and improving its interconnectivity between different parts of the brain, different neurons on the brain, etc. Um, <clears throat> then humans are lifelong learners. Uh, we talked a little bit about how, what is lifelong learning um, and we kind of tied it in then with technology and how technology is supportive of lifelong learning and for example but we can see how lifelong learning and technology can go hand in hand through mmocs to social media youtube ted talk google classroom zoom etc and they're all available. It's the part with the ecosystem of lifelong learning involvement with technology. That's just, I really want to include that part again, that all these things create the ecosystem of lifelong learning on the internet. Then also utilizing these new technologies and digital uh, literacies um, that the internet provides for lifelong learners. These create positive environments that can cultivate lifelong learning and help the lifelong learning process utilize and helps people develop these skills that are come along with lifelong learning. Um, lifelong learning and its interaction with technology has many positive effects on the individual and on society. It can improve social conclusion, inclusion, <clears throat> active citizenship, individual growth, competitiveness, and employability. And finally, the implementation of technology is crucial for supporting 21st century learners because 21st century learners, we as 21st century learners 
are lifelong learners because of how integrated we are with technology. And so in order to continue learning, like the implementation of technology needs to occur within all educational settings, because as 21st century learners, it is we are so connected that it's important to utilize it in the ways that are effective and that we're used to. And last but not least, when it comes to learning, you should seek support, encourage others, and believe in yourself. Um, and that's kind of what I want to send you off with today. But thank you for tuning in. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, and you learned a little bit about how learning works, how informal learning works, all that stuff. But I hope to see you next week. And um, yeah, thanks for tuning in.